and welcome to Zoom Track by InRail. This is the place for in track and T track and Fremo in home layouts, club layouts, no layout. <laughs> it's all good. If it's in scale, then you're in the right place. As usual, we have a full hour of programming today. Quick rundown of the schedule looks like this. I think we're going to attempt to connect live and uh, from Altoona, Pennsylvania for the big meet that's going on there. Bruce has got a comment to welcome a new partner. Terry will be talking T-Track and we have that in a pre-recorded video. Lee Hawkins will give us an update on the Farragut Loop modules. And we'll end with Gordy Robinson talking about the internationally acclaimed 3D printed Fremo modules he's uh, built himself. Q&A, a survey at the top of the hour. So we are about to get started. So let's see. Matt is going to be on the line here talking a little bit about <laughs> Alpha. Hey guys, uh, welcome. So we're dialing into you from the um, 2024 Mike Phillips InScale Weekend. We're in Altoona, Pennsylvania. We're at the Blair County Convention Center. Uh, this show has been going on for a lot of years. It's sponsored by the Altoona Association of Model Railroaders. Uh, that particular club is actually celebrating their 75th anniversary this year. So it's a big thing for them. Uh, the show here is fantastic. If you've never been to the InScale Weekend, um, it's awesome. There's a ton of stuff going on. Uh, we've got a huge number of layouts here. We've got four different N-Track clubs with their own layouts here. We've got Cantington N-Track. We've got the Penn Scalers. We've got Baltimore area N-Track and we've got train track. We've got a large Fremo N layout that's got a bunch of different folks participating. We have what we call the combined T-Track layout. That's where a bunch of folks like me um, my name is Steve Jackson. I'm actually from Northern Virginia in track. I forgot to introduce myself. Uh, I'm also the membership chair for NRAIL. Um, I'm participating in that combined T-Track layout. That's where a bunch of us individuals that join come in. But we've also got uh, separate layouts for different clubs. We've got the Twin Tiers in track club has a T-Track layout. Iron City in scale modelers has their own T-Track layout. The Genesee Ontario model engineers, they have their own T-Track layout. Maryland T-Track is here. And the uh, NMRA, MER, Keystone Division has a T-Track layout here too. There's also two kind of unique layouts that are here. We've got the Steel Town N-Scalers. It's hosted by Esther Hobbies. And it's a unique a modular layout because it kind of looks like a T-Track module. And it's two-track mainline, but it has its own legs like an N-Track module. So it's sort of a hybrid in there. But it's some really, uh, really cool models that they've got there. In addition to a really neat end loop it actually has this enormous, uh, it's, well, it's hard to describe. It's a really long end loop where the train kind of circles in on itself, goes around the dog bone and all the way back out again, but it's a lot of fun to see. And then the Birdsboro and Reading Railroad has a unique modular layout. It's uh, more like a home layout in that it's modular, but not following any particular standard. But we've been having a fantastic time here. The weather's great. Pennsylvania is a fantastic place to visit. Uh, so if you've never visited the show, definitely please do. Um, I think that's all I had to say about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thanks. Steve. We appreciate that. That's given me quite a bit of FOMO uh, for missing that this weekend. Couldn't quite get the approval to do it this year. But thanks for the update there. Anybody have any questions? Bruce, I think you have an announcement about a new partner. Yes, just want to go ahead and welcome the Colorado Model Railroad Museum. They are they just joined uh, today, in fact, and they're offering a 50% discount on admissions to members. Uh, we also have some addition. I think there are at least one or two additional uh, module uh, manufacturers who have joined um, either since the last meeting or this summer. So check out the partners page on the website and see what discounts are being offered there and uh, enjoy. Thanks, that's John. Fantastic. That's fantastic. I, I can personally vouch for the Colorado Model Railroad Museum being an awesome place to go. Uh, Michelle Kimpamu will host you in one of the 
really amazing kind of home layout turned to museum layouts that you'll ever see there. That is really cool. Super, super. Okay, excellent. Glad to see our partner uh, program still growing and new people joining. Momentum is uh, is building. So, Bruce, uh, I think we're ready for talking P-Track with Terry. Welcome to Talking T-Track. This month, we'll talk about using the Digitrax AR1. Until we have dead rail and self-powered trains in end scale, we will have electrified rails and power polarity issues. DC trains have double pole, double throw toggle switches. DCC trains have auto reversers. The Digitrax AR1 auto reverser is a common device used to allow DCC trains to enter reverse polarity track sections of T-Track. Permanent installation is not required. I am known to promote the building of turnout singles. Why? Because to promote operations involving existing sidings or allow double mainline passing, turnout singles can be inserted into any T-Track layout anywhere. T-Track, as a modular format, allows us to build different layouts each time with new or different modules along with our old standbys in different locations for different operational challenges, not just the same old layout every time. The addition of turnout singles in different locations adds to the variety. When the adjacent tracks are of different polarity, the required insulation can be added with insulated rail joiners between modules. Double crossovers may not be totally prototypical, but they do add flexibility and interest to our N-scale world. Trouble is, the outer rails of the double crossover should be cut with a hobby saw to create total left-right insulation. In most cases, when it is desired to use crossovers between the red and yellow tracks, the yellow bus wiring connections are reversed at the power source but this might not always be possible. Also, when both tracks are supplied from the red bus, this is not an option. Take a Cato three-way extension cord and cut it in half. Connect the two pieces to the AR1 as shown in the photo. The AR1 can be permanently mounted to a module or located under a layout or placed in an enclosure for protection and portability. The enclosure could be 3D printed, constructed of laser cut wood, or a commercially available box to create a portable AR1 for use in any layout as desired. For those who use heavy bus cables and power pole connectors, the cattle wiring could be replaced, but the wiring connectors on the AR1 are very small and only small gauge wire such as cattle wiring will fit. These are the pages of the AR1 information that comes with the Digitrax AR1. They're included here so that you can read them at your leisure from the PDF file on the nrail.org website, or you can pause the video on YouTube and read them at your leisure for your information. Here's a scenario. Standard T-Track condition Yellow bus supply not reversed at the source, creating 
passing or run around ability on one side of a layout loop with two single crossovers. When the yellow bus is of normal T-track polarity, not reversed, the single crossovers are used, only one auto reverser and its bus is necessary for the yellow track section. With the crossovers insulated in the middle of the crossover track, insulated rail joiners are used in both rails of the yellow track as shown by the pointy thing at each end of the reversing section. Same thing again, only this time with two double crossovers. When the yellow bus is of normal T-track polarity, not reversed, and double crossovers are used, two auto reversers and their buses are necessary. One for the red track section and the other for the yellow track section. With the outer rails of the double crossovers cut, no additional rail insulators are required. Single roll spines or balloon tracks. Now these are all red bus supplied. Single row spines and balloon track stems are the same as the others only different. Rather than the yellow bus being electrically opposite, the opposite direction red track is. The wiring remains basically the same as previously discussed. The single row spine with standard T-track loops on each end is the equivalent to a balloon on each end of a balloon track stem with the added yellow bus track inside, basically a dog bone layout, common at small shows. Again, talking about spines and balloon tracks, since spines are supplied from only the red bus, both tracks are connected to the bus. Using double crossovers requires two auto reverser buses, one for each track. Since both tracks are supplied from the red bus, why not use only one AR1 for both sections? Because there may be two trains, one trying to reverse the reversal of the other train. Again, since spines are supplied from only the red bus, both tracks are connected to the bus. Using single crossovers requires only one auto reverser bus for the track section involved. Insulated rail joiners are required at the ends of the auto reverser track section. AR1 tips. This comes from the Digitrax FAC page on their website. There are a bunch more items, but these are two of the most important, I feel. Insulated rail joiners should not be level with the top of the rails or protrude above the rails preventing the metal wheels of the locomotive from making good, positive contact as they bridge the gap between the rails, creating the short circuit fault current necessary for the AR1 operation. For very long reverser track sections, place the AR1 as close to the gaps as possible to prevent long runs of track from reducing the fault current available at the AR1 connection. For double-ended sections, perhaps mounting in the middle would be best.
Auto reversal track section limits. Locomotives. Auto reversal track sections need only be as long as the locomotive consists that will use them. A small 44 tonner or consolidation, or a double headed set of big boys, or an ABBA set of F's or E's, or maybe a power move of Alcos and Jeeps. But now this is a really big but. Metal wheel sets are not new. They've been around since the beginning of end scale time. The metal wheels on rolling stock will trigger the auto reverser operation too, just like the metal wheels of locos. If 50 car trains or longer are planned, the auto reversal track section will probably not be that long. So, if the consist has all metal wheels, now most newer rolling stock has metal wheel sets, your total train length can only be as long as the auto reversal track section it will pass through, unless operations do not include activation of the auto reverser. So, when assembling the train, Place all the rolling stock with metal wheels towards the front of the train and complete your long train with rolling stock that still has plastic wheel sets. A few scenarios. On the top we have a red line train on the red line. We have a yellow line train on the yellow line. The auto reversing section, the, yellow, the auto reversing section is in the yellow line, was selected for red line polarity from previous operations. When the yellow line train entered and the polarity auto changed to what we will say is the normal yellow line polarity. Since the trains were passing straight through, metal wheel sets were not an issue. The second scenario. On the red line, we have a dead train that just happens to be between the crossovers, allowing the red line train to pass by using the yellow line trackage. The auto reversing section was selected for normal yellow line polarity when the red line train entered and the polarity auto changed to red line polarity. Since the train was passing straight through the auto reversal section, metal wheel sets were again not an issue. Now, scenario number three. That doggone dead train didn't get stopped before it blocked the other crossover. So, the red line train had to enter yellow line trackage and will not be able to pull back onto the red line Fortunately, since the red line train was forced to continue into yellow line trackage, all the rolling stock with metal wheel sets were inside the auto reverser track section when the auto reverser track section auto changed to yellow line polarity because the loco exited the auto reversal section into yellow territory. So, this is my little Digitrax AR1 package uh, available to take with 
<laughs> for use in layouts as desired. The little plastic box came with four ball chocolates uh, as a Christmas little handout decoration thing. Just happened to be a perfect size. Thanks for watching. Okay, fantastic. Another very informative video. Thank you, Terry. Appreciate that. All right, we go from uh, T Track to Remo Inn. And Lee, good to see you again. I was thinking as I saw the uh, schedule today that it'd be hard to appreciate it unless you were at the Evanston meet. But I ran trains for three straight days and I never did get a train across the Farragut Loop modules. <laughs> so. Believe it or not, I still haven't run a train across uh, those, but I do get a chance to see them. So I'm lo looking forward to hearing more of the story, Lee. So this is part seven. If I start to go long, John, and we cut Gordy off, uh, let me know when I can stop and we can finish the scenery part later. So this is part seven for scenery. This is the way I did the scenery on Fergot Loop. This doesn't necessarily the best way or the worst way, but it is the way that I did it. So Refresh Farragut Loop is a former naval base in Northern Idaho. Um, the modules are built to the Fremo N standard. Um, so currently Farragut is a state park that my wife and I and my kids attend regularly, um, probably once or twice a month. Usually they're swimming and disc golf and hiking trails and uh, cross country meets out there at this time of year. So we enjoy it out there. Um, Farragut had a loop out there during World War II. It was only around for a couple of years. Um, here's the, the blueprints for the loop is originally designed. Um, here's my modular version of it. Uh, so it consists of 11 different sections that uh, break into seven different Fremo N standard modules. And so today we're going to work on scenery. So here's what it looks like today. A little bit of gravel where the old roadbed used to be. And all the trees are about the same height because in the 1940s, they clear cut everything and put the railroad in. So uh, there's a picture of the, the, bus, the roadbed that's still there. It's a, a gray with flecked dark gray ballast. And... I did find some ballast that pretty closely matches that. I'll show you later on in the, in the presentation. Um, first of all, as you can see out there, there's lots of trees. So here's my tree making materials. Um, I've got a shaker full of a dark or a standard green foam. Um, I've got the hairspray and then the, small, the other shaker has a dark green foam in it. And I shake over top of the buckets so that uh, I can reuse my the droppings that don't make it in. Um, I went on eBay and I bought 500 plus little tiny trees. They range from an inch and a quarter to two inches tall. Cause like I said, everything was clear cut in the forties. So in the 1980s, they're probably 40, 50 feet tall by then which is about an inch and a half to two inches high. Um, working through these trees, I sprayed over the garbage can so all the hairspray residue ends up in the garbage can so I don't end up sticky all over. Um, here's one of the trees that I'm working on. Um, I spray it first and then I sprinkle ground foam all the way around it and then I spray it again and then I sprinkle the other contrasting color just very lightly over top of that and then I spray it once more. When I'm done with that, I've got a big piece of foam and I start sticking them in the foam. Like I said, we had over 500, I think 512 trees on this 11 section set of modules. So there was a lot of trees. I sprayed trees and made trees for days and days and days. And there's the last one. I had to take a picture because it was the last one. Um, after I got done with the trees, I was working on trees at the same time I was working on the rest of the modules. I started laying out where my buildings were going to go, uh, where some of my scenery stuff was going to go. I uh, started um, cutting into the foam or building up the foam to make the, the varied scenery. Um, 
when I first started this project, I went and took five or 600 pictures of Farragut, figured out where all the cuts and all the fills were. And I tried to, to mirror that as best I could. It's not perfect, but it's, it's pretty close. Um, we decided to do a, a caboose uh, campground because it, now it is a state park. And so we figured they had some cabooses there. So there's one of my cabooses and I decided to light it. And if you look on the car, you'll see one of those Atlas Cato split light boards that come out of like the GP30s, the old um, GP35s, GP9s, that sort of thing. Um, it already has the resistor on there and the LED light. And so I just wired two lights to it and stuck it through the bottom of the module. And I'll show the installation of that later in the presentation here today. Um, we decided to put a road in because there is a road that crosses the track. So we're laying out where that goes. And there's the, the road. I had some uh, laser cut uh, uh, wood for the center. And I don't remember where I got that. And then I used uh, styrene for the road itself. Glued it down with copious amounts of caulk and looks like green chilies today is the weights. It varies from day to day what I grab off the shelf. Uh, I had a whole bunch of deer, so we picked some deer up out of the box and found some places, picked out a whole bunch of deer to put on the modules because there's a lot of deer out there. We usually see one or two whenever we go out there. Um, I needed something to block the end of one of my stubs that goes off to the industrial area. So I found an old Roco switch, Arnold switcher. There it is in the background. And I removed the motor out of it and prepped it so that it would mount right there. So you can't push cars off the end to the module because the locomotive is sitting there and I'm gonna glue it down later on so it doesn't move and you can't push past it. So we don't ever put anything on the ground because no one wants to pick up cars off the ground after you've pushed them off accidentally. Um, I went through and tried to weather it. I've learned how to weather better since then. So we may pick it back off and weather it some more. Um, the next thing I did was start to cut fascia. So I went around and measured how long each of my fascias needed to be. And I just wrote that on the side of the module so I didn't have to measure three times and cut four times. So all the measurements were written down all the way around the modules. I cut all the, the fascia pretty rough where I wanted it. And then we took and we held it up to the foam that was already built and we drew the lines on the back of the fascia and then cut it to match. At this point, I also cut out all the holes for all the switch machines and all the uh, loco net BCC panels on the sides of the modules. So all that is pre-cut. So all my fascia and stuff sticks out further than my buttons and it sticks out further than my panels. So the panels are protected. So there's one of them. And get all this installed. That's the same piece from the backside. See the higher foam in the background there. Worked my way around. Uh, here's my piece of track that comes off the edge. So we raised the roadbed, the fascia to match the roadbed. And later I'll come back through and I'll cut that off smooth and I will file it down so it won't catch anything. For gluing the fascia on, I use the Daptex clear caulk and then Gorilla Glue. The Gorilla Glue or the wood glue goes on the bottom half where the wood touches wood and the caulk goes on the top half where the caulk touches or the fascia touches the foam board behind it. And you can never have too many clamps because there's 11 modules here and 22 or 23 pieces of fascia. It took me several days to glue it all on because I don't have enough clamps. Grabbed everything that I had and started gluing around and around and around. And there's a whole bunch of them getting glued and held in place getting all that in there. We pre-cut all the fascia to match the contours. I had just took it out with a jigsaw and then I will. And once all that is glued on, then I adjust the ground just a little bit more to match what the fascia was because it didn't always follow the line. It's natural nature. It doesn't always plan B what, it's not always flat. 
and it's not always contoured right. So I readjusted the foam with a, a long knife and then filled in all the gaps with more of that clear caulk. Work my way around the layout, filling in the gaps, filling in the cracks with the caulk. I like using caulk because it doesn't dry out and crack. It stays a little bit um, malleable. So if there is heat change, like when these went to Dallas, it was 106 degrees, 118 degrees, whatever it was there, versus North Idaho, where it gets down to 10 below zero. The garage gets down to probably 20 or 30 degrees in the winter. And so we need to make sure that these, the joints in the foam uh, have a little bit of flex in them. And so I find that the caulk works really well for that. Uh, working my way around, just showing the different contours, filling in the gaps with the caulk. There's my little industrial yard again. And here's the caboose uh, campground. I put some more roadbed foam down and I'm going to cut it down flat with the fascia because we'll have a gravel parking lot there here in a little bit. So, and after that, we found my favorite color of brown. I call it baby poop brown because that's what it looked like when I was, when I had little kids. So everything's coated in baby poop brown and it's going to sit and dry for a couple days. Just some images of the wet paint. Watching paint dry is one of the funnest things in the world. Now I'm testing to see how tall my trees are going to be on top of the raised uh, cuts where, I, where the track is cut into the earth and make sure that I still have clearance between my modules because my modules are stored and shipped and moved face to face and I only have six inches between the deck of one module and the deck of the other. And so the trees need to not interfere with each other. And I ran into an issue later, and I'll show that in the slideshow, where I have another module that's got four and a half inch trees on it. That's not part of this loop, but it's one of the mating modules that goes with it. Now we're going to start, that's a horrible picture, but we're going to start doing uh, the sub, the understory of the forest. And there's about 10 or 15 different colors of fine ground foam to bigger, thicker ground foam. And for putting it down, I use glue all, all purpose glue. Um, I do not use school glue, it doesn't work as well. And I use rubbing alcohol and I put it all, I put 45% uh, school glue, 45% water in a big jar. And the big jar, if you look in the bottom, has a couple marbles in the bottom. And then I put about 10% alcohol in there so that the stuff runs really well. And then I shake it with the marbles in the bottom. That's what you do with spray cans is there's a marble in it. So I figured I'd throw some marbles in my, in my glue to keep everything shook up. And then I use the little foam brush there in the foreground to paint everything. And then I use the eyedropper in the extreme foreground to go through and put in fine drops of glue. The little spray bottle is about 90% water and about 10% alcohol. And I use that to break up the glue even more once we get stuff started. So first I'll go through and I will paint the whole thing in the glue, uh, the glue solution. And then I'll start sprinkling colors on it um, with the darker light browns and then follow up with some patches and highlights of yellows and some light greens. And then I follow up with uh, a little bit of a forest blend and some small bushes. So we've got some little sticks and twigs in there. And every couple layers I go through and I will spray it down with the water. And then I'll go through with the eyedropper and drop um, more glue and water solution and then spray over that to make sure that everything is well coated with glue because these move every every couple months they get moved and I don't need any scenery falling off of these modules. It needs to be really solid. So there's a picture of the other side of it. Working my way around, um, getting the pieces and here we are to that road that I installed. Um, I put a piece of tape across it so we could keep the dirt and stuff off of the road. 
I'm going to come back in later and I will gravel that road. Peel it off before anything dries so the glue's still wet, peel the tape off. Um, I don't have any glue on the tracks. All you see on the tracks is just water and alcohol. So there's no glue on the rails right now at all. When I got to the yard, I did cover up the yard tracks and the switches because I didn't want to have to clean out any switches. Working my way around, there's the more of the upper, the, the understory. Here's the, the big yard with the big passing sidings in it. Everything covered in blue on the right-hand side is going to be a gravel parking lot. Um, I have a big wide brush that I use for brushing material away from the tracks as I go. So there's everything. It's got its understory in. We don't have any ballast down at all right now. I like to do the ballast after the understory. That way that we can blend it a little better and I don't have grass all over the ballast, but I do have some ballast on the grass and the grass pokes through a little bit on the edges. Um, this is one of the ballast spreaders I have. I don't like this one as much as the other one I have, but this one I can turn on and off. And so I'm ballasting the caboose track for the, um, the caboose campground and I need to be able to control how much ballast goes down. So I'm using it here, worked my way around beginning and end. And then I took and I spread some ballast down on top of the ground foam. And I've taped that uh, piece of tape and the paper there to catch the excess ballast that I'm gonna scrape off with the paintbrush here. Cause I wanna save that, I'll reuse it. It's clean ballast. It's just a little thick and I'm spreading it out. So this is the ballast that I chose. It's from Arizona Rock and Mineral Company. It's Pennsylvania Railroad Light Gray. It matches the, the rock that I did find out at Farragut really well. So that's why I chose this one. And there's the jar of it. I think I had four or five bags of ballast in there. This is the ballast spreader that I prefer to use on the main line track. Um, fill it up with ballast and drag it along the track. It does a, a really nice coverage um, and spreads it really well. And then with the once this is down, I go through and I will spray it all with the water mixture and then come back with the eyedropper and drop the glue and the glue mixture in on top of that. And then come back and spray it again with the water mixture. Work my way around ballasting everything, try to keep the ballast out of the switches. I did have a problem on a couple switches. I had to rebuild the switch after the mm. ballast was in. So ballasting around all the curves. Here's one of the joints, if you can see it in the railroad. I ballast with all the modules clamped together so we get nice clean joints. See, now you can see the joint. Um, this joint uh, got a little bit too much glue in it. And so I'm very carefully cutting it apart with a little putty knife and a, and a, and a what a utility knife, there's the word. And there it breaks apart. So this one's the one we did at the joint with all the PCB ties. The ties and the rails were already cut. So I was just popping the glue a little bit as I went through. Lee, John here, how are you doing on your uh, deck there? Are you, do you have a lot left or? Oh, I can split it into another presentation if that's fine. I just, you're, yeah, if you're not close to the end of it, I don't well, want to let's, rush. Let's finish the ballast here and yeah. see where we're at. So just some more pictures of the ballast coming around. Here's another picture of that joint. And we can stop here and get on to trees next time. Or I can continue. Let's stop there because I want to make sure that we okay. give you enough time to go through that. And uh, well, okay. there's some really great pictures there. Yep. Uh, so part two will be trees and the upper story and putting trains on the tracks and running it. So thanks for, for watching. If you want to see any of the other six presentations, they're all on Zoom track. You can go back and see them. So thank you. Thank you very much, Lee. I appreciate that. Um, Lee, I yes. have made a mistake in in some of my modules of putting so much glue on <laughs> on the tracks that I wish I knew a better way to do that. Uh, you don't worry about that too much? And um, With the eyedropper, I don't get too much glue on there. Mm -hmm. And I use lots of alcohol water to make it run in and soak in. Um, knock the, I knock the ballast down 
a little bit harder than I need to make sure that it's off the top of the ties. Yeah. So I don't get so much on there. Um, and the Arizona rock is actual rock where the, um, oh, what's the other company? There, theirs is um, shells or um, Woodland Scenics is a, is a shell of a something or other. So, and it tends to float a little bit where the Arizona rock sinks. So I like it. the Arizona rock. Right I've used both. Yeah. Um, all right. Super. Great. Thanks, Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Lee. Yep. The, uh, the saga will continue with trees next time. And <laughs> appreciate that. Walnuts. There you go. Okay. Uh, well, let's go. Uh, Gordy, you with us? You going to tell us a little bit about your 3D printed modules? I mean, yeah, I thought I was getting away with it then, but yeah, sure. I, I didn't uh, want to let you off the hook. No, of course not. That's <laughs> all right. Uh, give us a sec and oh, boy. By magic, you should be able to see my slides. So let's go. So this presentation uh, was was written originally for Freemo N, but um, you can 3D print anything. So it's uh, very applicable. You do T-Track 3D printed modules. You can uh, you could do N-Track, I guess. Um, you might need to put some lead in there to, to get them heavy enough. Um, but you can do that. And uh, you can also 3D print hex track modules because I've done it. So uh, pretty well anything you want. And we know that people can 3D print it. You see in my slides, just John, I just wanted to check. You definitely seen them. Yes, all good. Yeah, uh, good. Shared the right screen. Excellent. Um, okay, so the good thing is we can skip a lot of my slides because you guys know what Fremo N is. So this is a traditional Fremo N setup. It's the pitch by Mark Watson from the 2019 National Train Show in Salt Lake City. Um, you can play spot your modules if your modules are there at any time you want, but not right now. Um, so traditionally, um, much more fluid than than other modular types. Um, no tables involved. Um, go any shape that you want, um, and and away you kind of go. Traditionally, a Fremo N module is made from ply and foam. Um, is quite lightweight compared to some of the other modular types, particularly more lightweight than the NMRA's modular. Um, standard which is very outdated now with the five and seven uh, inch mains and in ho but no it's i know we're on end but you know they're heavy right uh so they're pretty lightweight to start with but the challenge that was given to me was if we're all coming to dallas you better be bringing a module and for those that don't know uh, gordy lives in the uk and that involves an airplane um so it had to be a little bit lighter than even a, a Fremo N module. Otherwise, um, I'm, I don't partake in the not changing your clothes and not washing when at train events. I, I do like to have clean clothes and I do like to have a wash. So I uh, needed to make this light enough that I could still take clothes in my bag. So why we don't use plywood is because two end plates in birch ply weigh almost 30 ounces. This is based on a 12 inch wide module, which is not that heavy, but just trust me, the plane I get on from where I live to get to the mainland to fly to America is really small and they really don't like heavy things on the plane. So 30 ounces adds up quite quite quickly. So a two foot module with a plywood frame and a foam top can easily start weighing over four kilos or 10 pounds, which is just way, way too heavy, uh, which is where the 3D printing came in. By 3D printing, you can save about 75% of the weight. Um, all I will say on this before we move on, though, is if everybody 3D printed their modules, we might have difficulty with the rigidity and strength of the whole overall, overall setup. But um, it is possible to have some 3D printed modules in a big setup, and it'll be absolutely fine. So there are some challenges with 3D printing. If we used 100% infill, infill is what goes between the outside walls of your print. If we used 100% infill, then the 3D print's going to weigh more than plywood. <laughs> um, 
the size of your printer, i.e. the build point, is limiting, so you can't print an entire module in one piece. Filament was more was more expensive than a sheet of plywood, but filament for a 3D printer is now cheaper than plywood. Um, thank whoever you want to thank for that. I'm not getting into there. I am not the Pope to make political statements, but that's the situation that we're in. You There is some basic learning of some of CAD, but you're drawing squares, so it's quite easy. Um, but if you want to go beyond a basic frame, you will need to have some CAD knowledge. If you don't and you're happy with a basic frame, then I have provided some prints that we'll talk about in a little while. Um, printed material did need to use special adhesives, but I have found that standard viscosity, uh, medium viscosity um, super glue works perfectly well to hold these things together. And once you put the foam sheet in the top and you um, uh, glue that in place with foam adhesive, then it's solid and it's going nowhere. So initially we did a proof of concept, which was going to be a 12 by 18 inch module, and then that needed to slim down to being a 12 by 12 module to fit inside the box that we found for it. Um, it is a modular design, so you could have extended it. Um, I tried to 3D print absolutely everything on this prototype, uh, which was a mistake, uh, but it, it works. It's still here. Um, and it was fine. Uh, we did a 30% cell scale module to just get it, get it, uh, get it all gluing together. 30% size is great because it saves a lot of material, and also your tolerances are really tight. So if it goes together nicely, then it all goes together when you blow it up to full size. So this is what the frame looks like. It's various 3D printed sections that we did for this. We did 50% infill. There's no plywood. Those that have seen my modules will go, Gordy, where's the plywood? There is no plywood. This was an attempt, attempt number one. So we didn't use plywood, but 50% infill was starting to get almost as heavy as plywood. So what's the point, right? We'll come on to what we did later as we go. So these are the sides. There was a slot for a cross member to give it rigidity. It's only a square one foot by one foot module. I'm going to flip forward. So you can use CAD to do very fancy, very nice designs of scenery to give you a sub base for your scenery. If you've got time, this was great. Uh, definitely good for doing modules that have uh, got tunnels and bridges and rivers and streams and all that lovely stuff. Uh, but it's time consuming. It takes a long time and, and you know, you're printing a lot of stuff there. Um, but because you're 3D printing it, we were able to add in hold, uh, supports for feeder wires, alignment guides, all that kind of good stuff. And here we are printing module number one on an Ender 3 printer, which is from Creality. Uh, a Creality Ender 3, you can buy them for about 100 bucks. So it's not expensive to get into doing this uh, and being successful. But there are limits on the build plate size. And you see how small that actually is. Uh, this is me taking over the kitchen, but I do all the cooking, so it's fine. So as you can see, this all started to come together. Um, the eagle-eyed amongst you will notice that I've made a mistake. And uh, even though I'm a master model railroader, I like to admit my mistakes because no one is perfect. Um, because I shrunk this down, I didn't count properly and ended up with a 10 mil, or just, a, just under half an inch wide gap between my top sections, which I had to build a filler piece for. And that's what you see down the center there is a filler piece. But this is all 3D printed. This section here was 3D printed too. This was the bridge. This is all done using a resin printer. Most of my other stuff is all done with filament. Um, as we start to put the scenery on, you can apply scenery material. But what I do um, is I apply, when I don't use foam and I use the plastic, what do you glue to? Well, I actually use some brown parcel paper. Uh, did all of my static grass onto the brown paper at my workbench and then brought it across and cut it and fit it to the actual module, which worked really well. Start to see the module going together. That's another sheet of uh, styrene. I have to use my American terms. Uh, styrene down the middle, plastic card to anyone from the colonies, uh, not from the colonies, sorry, and then just a bit of stone ballast down our side. Um, and then this was the test. So Somebody said, you better clamp it before it gets to Dallas. So I did apply a clamp to it um, and it didn't break. But you can see that the new, I was prototyping a new composite type of uh, end plate, which is what we now use. 
which has got uh, a very thin sheet of one and a half mil thick ply. You could buy this on Amazon, already cut 100 mil by 100 mil or four inches by four inches off Amazon. Uh, hobby laser cutters use these to make Christmas ornaments. So you can you can get them in the 3D print design. It was dead easy to just do a recess for that to be glued into. And that meant that we could reduce the infill from 50% uh, to 10% saving tons and tons of weight and material um, and so that's what all my end plates are now printed like here it is in the box so this is in a really use this is a product called really useful box they're made in the uk they test them by driving tanks over the top of them um, if you go on their website on reallyusefulbox.co.uk you'll see a picture somewhere of them with vehicles and all sorts of stuff parts on top of these boxes you can buy them in the us from staples um, and then we just cable tie the module into the bottom of the box and throw that into a normal suitcase. Uh, the plan with this originally was it had to be able to fit in a carry-on, hence why it was 12 by 12, and that's what we did. So that will fit in a carry-on uh, to, to take onto the plane. So what did we learn from this prototype? Basically, we've covered it as we've gone, but one of the most important things is scenery base is quite time consuming. We needed to find a way to make these even lighter to get the infill down from 50%. Um, and the cost was at that point slightly more than a traditional plywood module. But if you've bought a sheet of decent ply recently, you'll know that that's probably not the case anymore. So here's the composite frame end. Um, it's very similar to what you've got. And it's got this, you just glue in with some CA uh, sheet of ply in the middle. You reduce the infill to 20%. You can actually reduce it to 10% and they're absolutely solid. Uh, no problems whatsoever. Um, and that gives you a clamping zone. The, the track is centered on these modules. So the, as long as the plywood's under where your track's going to go, that's where the clamp's going to go. There have been some issues where people have been setting the modules up and not realized that they need to clamp on the plywood. Um, and they've gone straight through the side. But, you know, generally they're, they're still in one piece after a couple of uses and anything that's been clamped on the plywood's been absolutely fine. So we then moved on to a 90 degree mod crossing module. I've got some pictures of this in this in the in a little while, but this shows you what the drawings look like. So the black is the plywood, the red and the blue and the yellow are all different components that just all slot together, CA between on all the seams, and then a sheet of uh, one inch thick foam down the center in it goes. I know you guys in the US like to use 50 mil foam or two inch foam, but it's not required. Uh, one inch under four heating foam is perfectly adequate and saves you weight and saves you money. So that's what we use. So there it is with its foam scenery base. OK. So what this means now we've got this sectional design is we can start to make a rectangular module of any size that we want. So I've made uh, the standard sizes being 50, 150 mil or six inch sides and you slot them together and away you go. Um, I've actually made sides now that are up to 300 mil or 12 inches long. So the sections that are, that are longer. The reason why I did them at 150 mil is because that will print on an ender free printer, which is a basic one that someone would start with. So if you've got a bigger printer, away you go. I now have, how many? No, hang on. I have a lot more than one <laughs> filament printer. My wife may find this. Uh, YouTube video. Um, I have multiple filament printers. Uh, the biggest one that I've got is a Neptune 4 uh, from Eligu. Um, it retails about four to five hundred dollars. Um, if you hold off, Black Friday is upon us very soon. You could probably pick one of those up for less than four hundred dollars. Um, it's got self-leveling. The, the thing's bulletproof um, and it's really, really good to print with. So um, and I know a number of people have been successful taking my my designs and printing them in the US at the moment. So it's all working out really well. So you don't need to uh, you don't need to go and send your prints off anymore. So the sides are just like this. We have a male and a female left and right. and We have a male and male, as I call it. And you just slot them together. And then these tabs slot into the end plates. It's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Um, Greg in the, I think it's Greg um, in the, or Marshall, one or two, uh, in the, um, Texas have started, uh, I think it's Marshall actually, have started using dovetail joints like you would for woodwork. So they slot together vertically. So there are other people 3D printing now in different ways. But this it's is mine. Marshall. It's Marshall, there we go. So it's Marshall that's doing it. Um, so these just slot together. 
So what do these look like with some scenery? So here's the different ones that we currently have. Uh, this is the, the tour of, these are on tour in the United States. I don't actually know who's got this module at the minute, but this is Highland Station. It was with Ed uh, in Oregon uh, or Washington State, wherever you are, Ed. Um, I think you're in Portland, so we'll say Oregon. Um, it was there last year and did a number of shows. Uh, they didn't, Ed didn't manage to break it, which is great. Um, he tried. That was the whole point of sending this out there so it could go and be transported and set up and set up again and again and again. Um, here's a picture of it in Ed's house. Here's a picture of it at Evanston, and it ran really well. Pretty flawless module. Um, it's about 570 mil long, so just under two foot, 20, 20, 20 or 21 inch, something like that. And then here is the 90 degree crossing module that I showed you the pictures of earlier. It's 13 inches by 13 inches, so it's not a 12 by 12 square. Thank you, Lee, uh, for pulling that one out as I was designing it because that allows us to slide modules to the left and right if the tracks are not quite centered on them. Um, but of course, we're all brilliant builders and we center everything. So here it is set up at Evanston. Um, I'm going to show you, we, we, we found some problems with this because that's got forces acting on it in all four directions. It's effectively four endpoints, but there's other forces going on that. And when this first was used by Lee, uh, well, I think the second or third time it was used, we started to find that the weight of the wooden modules going on it was forcing the center to rise as it was compressing the foam. So what I did is I 3D printed a uh, custom strut for this so that it had cross members going on the diagonal and I shipped it to Lee. <laughs> Lee had to put some plywood in. So this is now really a very heavy module uh, because I didn't quite have the size just right for the ends. Um, I did my best. Um, so we had to put some plywood in here. So this is now a completely composite module that's absolutely bulletproof. Um, but yeah, just be aware that if you're going to uh, compress a, four, a 3D printed module in four directions, it's going to compress more than plywood will. And this is the latest one. This was the auto rack yard module. Uh, this is with speed in Dallas at the moment. It will be up in Novi, I think. Um, certainly it'll be coming to Novi for me to take it home or give it to somebody else to play with uh, for a year. Uh, this is three sections. So there's one, there's two, there's three. They're all 600 mil long. Uh, there's end points only on the end. And there's, the middle sections are only four inches tall, uh, four inch deep sides. So it saves on weight and material. The end points are standard six inch depth. Um, and the sections just screw together uh, with some bolts that go through. So they're always aligned. And it's got plastic conduit for legs just to save weight again. You're thinking, how on earth did you get on an aeroplane with an 1800 mil long module? Well, we did. It fits into that box there, which is the maximum size for a US airline uh, of, a, of a checked bag. So mm -hmm. if you're flying Southwest, guys, um, then Southwest will let you take two of these boxes, I guess. And obviously a carry on because we are adults and we wash and change our clothes. Um, so you've got plenty of room for a change of clothes for a weekend, but you can effectively fly with 3D printed modules anywhere and, and attend a free an event on the other side of the country, or even across in a different continent as I do. Um, and you could take up to 12 foot of modules quite easily in that box, no problem at all. And there's room for some stock. As long as you take less stock than John Doring, you will be fine. So there's still plenty of room for stock. Um, but wait, there's more. So 3D doesn't mean it has to be straight. We can do curves. Um, and so here are some modules uh, that I have done with curved sections. Um, on the left, we have a Y module um, that gives us a diverging 22 inch radius. And on the, the right, we have a 22.5 degree, 22 inch radius curve section. Now. Um, officially, these won't meet the standard because they don't have a room for uh, three inches of straight on each end, but that's very easy to do because you can 3D print a straight three inch section onto the sides and slot it in and you will have your three inch of straight um, at the end of the modules. I've just done these as minimum, uh, minimum size because I was desperately trying to see could I fit a Y module in a case. 
no is the answer to that, I'm afraid. No, I cannot fit one of these in a case. But uh, the curved sections, kind of, I can. So, uh, but I can't take very many of them. So I have been sending the designs of the curved sections over to Ohio, and they are being printed, uh, ready for Novi next year. I've done a 36 inch radius curve section as well. I'm about to go and redraw this because Lee said he needed more 45s at 22 inch radius. So I'm about to send that over to somebody um, so we can do more corners. So I have three resources. I've nearly finished what we're doing for time. Oh, look at that, I'm great. So um, if you go to Thingiverse, you go to Gordy MMR, you'll see some of my designs. I am a little bit behind uploading my latest designs. So nudge me, message me through there or just email presidents at nmra.org and I will send you my latest designs. Um, I don't tend to do custom CAD work, but if you really want to get into this, I'm happy to help people. Um, if you drop me an email, I'm happy to, to do a little bit of work. Um, if you want me to do more, then we'll, we'll come to an agreement. Um, but some of the other tools you're going to need. So I suggest you get yourselves, if you don't already, get a personal license, a hobbyist license for Fusion 360. It's piece of CAD software that is uh, designed for drawing things in 3D. You can use SketchUp, you can use other things that are free out there, but Fusion 360 is really quick and easy to learn. Um, I love it because it allows you to click a little button over here on the left and you can draw and sketch in 2D and then click off, put, put your sketch and then extrude it into 3D. It's great, so easy to use. Um, and so I do all my drawing in Fusion 360. Um, if you want to use it for commercial purposes, hence why you have to come to an agreement with me, then there is a pay, paid version of the license as well. You're going to need the 3D printer. This is an Ender 3. I said on here you can grab them for $100 to $150. dollars they probably about $100 or less now. Um, and Ender 3 has been around for a long time. It's a great 3D printer to start with. Uh, you can do a lot of modifications with it. Um, it's a great one to start and learn and you can 3D print almost any of them other than the curved modules you can 3D print any of the modules that I've shown you in the presentation on one of these because I've done it uh, but of course you can if you've got a bit more money to spend I would recommend going with uh, something like an LEDU Neptune and if you can got the space get a Neptune 4 Max because you can print curves and everything um, and then you were going to need slicing software this is where you would set your infill and slicing software will come free with your printer. Whether you use a Creality slicer or use Eligu slicer, it doesn't really matter. Um, you take your 3D design, you drop it into here, either from CAD or from Thingiverse, drop it into here, manipulate how you want it to appear. And then up here, you've got your settings for 20% as your infill and everything like that. So dead easy to use um, and it's free with your printer. So you don't need to worry about it. And then if you get a bigger printer, you see the print bed's bigger. This is for my Ender. Uh, this was for, oh, that's an Eptune 4 Max. Yep, so that's the big one. So you can see here, simultaneously, we're going to print an end plate and we're going to print corners, uh, sides for a curved module. That's going to be a 22.5 R22 radius section. So we just need to print one more end plate and we're done. See the leg pockets are there as well, which we didn't really touch on, but there's leg pockets. So we're all good to go. And then in my defense, I was set a challenge and then left unsupervised. So this may or may not be a good idea. So far, it's working out through good luck, I think, more than good management. Uh, but there's still people with my 3D printed modules. And I know of people that have taken my designs off Thingiverse and printed them and turned up at shows and someone's gone, that's Gordy's module. And they've gone, no, I printed this. But yeah, but that is Gordy's module. Um, so it's great. So yeah, please feel free, to, feel free to use my designs or reach out to me and uh, give it a go. If you're definitely, if you're a bit shy with woodwork, this is another way to go. And if you want to fly around the world and do Fremo and then, or anything else, go for it. John, that's it. Gordy, thank you so much. I appreciate that very much. I um, Two things that came up, for me, and this is like the second or third time I've seen this presentation of Gordy's, one was, you know, because I thought to myself as he was doing that, oh, I don't think I would ever do that. Uh, and I could probably build something the same weight out of a lightweight wood. Uh, but one thing you did mention that I think is really important is um, you can design this module with all the holes in the right places, you know, or you can add different things to it, or you can put the leg pockets on and 
things like that make you think differently about, I think, uh, you know, kind of additive design and building like that. So that was interesting. The other thing I took away from your presentation, Gordy, was even if you're not, and you talked in one of one of them about how you had to how you had to sort of reverse engineer the whole thing from starting from the weight of a of a suitcase filled to the size of the box to the you know the how much weight the fo you know the foam packing was going to be. You just kind of went all the way backwards until you got to okay, this is what the what's left over for the module. And I think that's a good way of thinking about module building in general, because they, they have to fit somewhere, they have to mate together, they have to go in the car, you know, even for those of us who aren't taking them all around the world, um, thinking about what the end product looks like, how much it's going to weigh, what size it's going to be. So I think there were some useful lessons from all of that as well. So thank you very much. Any uh I think we're at the top of the hour. We probably want to put the the poll up, uh, Bruce, don't we? And uh, if anybody else has a question, wants to jump in, please do. Step it's up. And I encourage everybody to fill it out, please. We we do look at the results. We will be posting um, this episode on YouTube, uh, usually before the the next uh, Zoom track, and we'll uh, we usually have an an index on there. So if you want to go back and review any of the presentations, you can do so. Uh, especially one like Gordy's, which is has a lot of really good information in it that provides good. Uh, uh, research and, and reference yeah. material. Okay. Just looking to see if I have any. All right. Well, I think I, I have one quick question yeah. for Gordy. Um, you you've done some work with the with the CAD programs. How long did it take you to figure them out? Did you have any background in in CAD work? Um, so when yeah, I'm quite young, but when I was taught technical drawing, I used a pencil and a rule. So no, um, but I've used I've used CAD products, but not to this extent. So I. It didn't take me very long. It's addictive. Um, it didn't take me very long. And there are loads of people out there in the hobby that are pretty good CAD users. Um, so I just watched a couple of YouTube videos. If I got stuck with something, there's loads of YouTube videos out there and you can just watch one and, and kind of figure it out. But no, look, all you're doing is drawing squares, right? It's easy. Just measure, draw the square. It's a lot easier than doing it with a ruler because it's exactly what you want. You can type in exactly how long you want the line to be, yeah. exactly what angle you want. It's great. Okay. Another example of, of in our hobby of somebody who knows how to do something, saying it's easy. <laughs> be, be forewarned, right? <laughs> it's not it's not easy, but <laughs> you've got to you've got to like anything, you've got to give yourself a period of time learning curve time yeah. box it where you say i'm going to spend two or three weeks at this and if i can't get it i'm just not going to punish myself any further that's basically what you've got to do. by the way you may be young compared to a lot of us but you're not quite young anymore <laughs> no i'm old I'm, I'm 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 old i feel it at work all the time there working in the technology and being in yeah. your 30s is right. old you're not you're not quite young <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you all for joining again. We appreciate everyone coming and being loyal to the program. Hope you're getting something out of it. And we will see all of you here this time next month.